Welcome to this web training on preventing unwanted headlines, or as it is also known by a less appealing title, internal audits. Do you wonder how internal audits could prevent unwanted headlines? Or do the words internal audit make your eyes glaze over? And just for clarification, I am not talking about the extensive annual external audit performed by an accounting firm. These internal audits discussed here are performed in-house. Every board member and director of nonprofit organizations needs to pay attention to its finances. The value of an internal audit cannot be overstated. In fact, it can be quite expensive to ignore. An internal audit helps answer questions such as, are checks and balances in place to reduce the risk of money going astray? Where are weaknesses in your daily operations that could allow the organization to become a victim of fraud? Are you wondering if this could happen to you? Well, it, it could. Seeing headlines like these, I used to wonder, how does this happen? Now, when speaking to organizations who do not audit themselves, I wonder why doesn't it happen more often? And it may happen more often than reported since headlines affect the way donors feel about giving. And just a side note, the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners reports an estimated 7% loss of gross revenue to employee fraud. Imagine adding that to your budget. We don't need internal audits, do we? Remember that people who embezzle are those we trust. Think about that for a second. Would you give the opportunity to someone you didn't trust? One reason that fraud happens is simply that the opportunity arises. Another reason could be lack of oversight. A secretary recently arranged for embezzlement said she took money because, quote, nobody was checking what I did, unquote. Next, please understand that annual external audits are not designed to, de to detect fraud. Fraud may be, be detected, but it's easier to spot fraud by those who are familiar with the organization's internal operations. And OK, small organizations have limited staff. We understand this problem since we only have three employees, two of whom are part-time. The solution here was to recruit board members. We encourage you to engage your board members in this way, too. And to make the process easier for you, a checklist is going to be coming at the end for you to download. You can modify the checklist to suit your needs. And as a matter of fact, we modify the checklist all the time. An internal audit is a proactive approach to fiscal responsibility. It helps guard against risks inherent to money management. These audits assure that the board receives accurate information to make decisions, that assets and records of the organization are not stolen, misused, or accidentally destroyed. It also assures that policies are being followed and that government regulations are met. An internal audit becomes a preventive measure. Having regular audits creates awareness that compliance is tested. And as mentioned earlier, just knowing someone's paying attention can change behavior. The internal audit may also be a detective measure. It can uncover problems with its random checks of transactions. So conducting audits is a mark of responsibility, not a symbol of distrust. And it's a responsible way to operate. What are the benefits of an audit? Well, it sets the expectation that fraud will not be tolerated. Again, simply creating that environment conveys the message that fraud won't be tolerated, and that will just diminish its occurrence. Another benefit of conducting audits is that it gives the board members who are involved an in-depth perspective about the financial needs of the organization. The cash flow cycles become more clearly understood. Things like, how does the fun money flow in? Who are we paying? Where does it go? Why bother with internal audits? 
Well, it fulfills the fiduciary responsibility of all the board members, and it assures that the directors of the organization delegate responsibility yet keep accountability. Doing audits creates an atmosphere where questions may be asked. Participants must ask questions. They must ask questions about vendors, questions about invoices, questions about anything not understood or readily recognized. So what are your goals? You want to validate that the controls are in place and in practice. OK, what are controls? Controls are practices such as requiring double signatures on checks or requiring that the payee on a check is not the same person that signs the check. These procedures assure that financial transactions are accurately, consistently recorded. They help minimize risk, including employee theft. Now that you have a clear understanding of controls to look for, you can begin to identify exceptions. The exceptions are when you find an error, and let's say we didn't have a double signature. That is an opportunity for you to, to look at and create a tighter, tighter procedure, a tighter control, so that it protects your assets and it won't happen again. Design your audit. OK, first you need some people to do it. So recruit enough participants to create the necessary checks and balances. Small board, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, in a small nonprofit, the board has to help carry this responsibility. Small organizations may not have enough staff for proper checks and balances. When recruiting these participants, look for board members who have independence and objectivity, experience with financial statements, and natural curiosity in inquiring minds. The second part of designing the audit is to brainstorm creatively. What steps could prevent losses? Imagine where the potential problems lie and find methods to prevent them. We have done this here. We've brainstormed. We've discovered ways our organization could be vulnerable. I often look at the electronic fund transfers and the ease with which they can be misdirected. After you've come up with all your ideas, write the plan. What financial issues apply to your agency? You need a plan that addresses your needs using your available resources. And then you implement monthly monitoring and reporting. We have done monthly because it, these audits need to be frequent enough to catch problems before they escalate. OK, now let's talk about the components. The components of the audit include verifying the physical existence of your assets. OK, what does that mean? It means look at, look at things like your, your account balances. Are the accounts reconciled every month? Do the canceled checks in the statement from the bank match the entry in the ledger? Have you, have you got your checks secured? Is, is there a way that someone could come in and pick them up and take them away? And never sign a blank check. What could those checks then be used for? Where's the credit card? Who has a credit card? How many are there? Is there an ATM card? And look around. Think about, hey, didn't we just print a, or purchase a printer? Think about what should be on site. Commonly, theft involves equipment and supplies, such as notebooks and pens. Remember, locks deter theft. Do employees really come to work planning to steal? Probably not. They may just come to the conclusion that no one will miss the stolen goods. So again, attention serves as a deterrent. Checks and balances is another component. Separation of duties, hmm, what does that mean? Hmm. It means that when the same person handles cash from when it comes in to where it, to where it goes out, the risk of fraud increases. So separation of duties means a system is in place where more than one person is accountable. Follow the cash. That means trace it from the time it gets there till the time it leaves the organization. Each step needs documentation to support the action. Many organizations have been surprised to discover that donations have disappeared. Donor checks can be misappropriated in creative ways. 
one scenario. A Charities R Us employee opens a bank account with the initials CRU, which just so happens to match the organization's initials. Then the employee takes donor checks and deposits them into that account. The donor now receives a thank you letter on letterhead from the organization. The donor has a cancel check and a thank you and the money has gone to the employee. How could you prevent this from happening? Well, you have to think about how money is received and recorded. And this is an example of separation of duties. One person opens the mail and stamps the checks, another prepares deposits, and a third takes deposits to the bank. More checks and balances that come um, from internal audits. Who is supervising management? If the director of an agency asks an employee to cut two, two checks, which bypasses the need for a double signature, the employee may feel obliged. However, if the agency director knows controls, such as the double signature requirements, are being checked, this awkward situation is much less likely. Looking for documentation. Have account reconciliations been done for all accounts, whether or not transactions have occurred? Transactions, look at the expenses. Are there invoices and receipts to support the purchase? Were the goods or services delivered? Who decided the expense was legitimate? Whose signature is on the check? Did anyone sign a check written to himself or herself? Invoices should indicate approval for payment. A written phrase such as, OK to pay, initialed by the appropriate per person would suffice. Are invoices signed and dated by the signer of the check? This proves that the document was reviewed and prevents fraudulent invoices from replacing the original. Interestingly, the, crea the creation of this presentation led us to having another um, added piece of that on invoices. We decided to have check signers write the check number on the invoice as well to verify that that was the check that were paid the invoice. The Association of Certified Fraud Examiners reports that 75% of cash misappropriations involve payroll through submitting more hours than worked or through ghost employees. Second, inflating vendor invoices or creating ghost in, uh, vendors. And third, false employee expense reimbursements. So keep these in mind when you're looking for documentation. Another component that an internal audit has is that you are preventing the loss of your exempt status. Do you have any activities that are endangering your status? Do you know what they are? Well, one activity that could endanger your status is, is an activity that substantially benefits a private individual organization. Second part of that is allowing the organization income to go to insiders. Examples of this include unreasonable employee compensation, transfer of property at less than fair market value, and loans to officers or employees. Are payroll taxes paid and filed on time? Uh, payroll taxes include things like Social Security, Medicare, withholding taxes. You've taken them from the employee and they must be given to the government on time. Third, are government forms filed properly? Even though it, an organization is tax exempt, there are reporting obligations. Remember to file the appropriate IRS Form 990 in a timely manner. Organizations lose exempt status after three consecutive years of not filing, and recently, many nonprofits experienced this very loss as the IRS enforced its policy. And be sure to comply with your own state requirements to maintain your status as a nonprofit. Communicate and improve. By generating written records, signed monthly, documentation exists that monitoring and oversight responsibilities are being fulfilled. When an error or potential problem is discovered, determine how and why, then build controls to prevent it. 
create a path of communication to board members by maintaining the reporting system. Here we report our findings every month to the Executive Committee. Following up on recommendations is crucial. Problem solving means nothing if resolution is not implemented and monitored. This holds true regarding recommendations from the internal audit and from the external audit. It takes a great deal to sustain an organization that serves charitable purposes. It takes very little to tear one down by depleting its resources. So to review, unwanted headlines are prevented when strong internal controls minimize the risk of loss, when a checklist assists the monthly review of controls, and when regular reporting assures that those procedures are being followed. This slide contains a few supplemental resources for answers to questions prompted by this limited discussion about setting up internal audits. And again, a checklist will be available momentarily to download as a starting point for you to design your internal audit. You have now begun the process of preventing unwanted headlines for your agency. Thank you very much for participating.